We Make Movies is recorded in front of a live audience in Los Angeles and is hosted by WeMakeMovies.org. Hello and welcome back to another episode of How We Make Movies. I'm Amanda Lippert, your host. So tonight we'll be talking with J.D. Walsh and Elizabeth Triplett. He is the director, executive producer, and writer. She's the co-producer, writer, and actress for Battleground, Hulu's first original scripted series. Uh, Battleground is a workplace dramedy. Uh, about, that goes behind the scenes with an unruly group of campaign workers and volunteers living on the campaign trail. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. No, that's, no, that's not our, our show's about dogs that it's, solve crime. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> please, please, audience, welcome our guests, J.D. Walsh and Elizabeth Triplett. Thank you. Nice. Thank you guys so much You're for welcome. joining us. Uh, are you guys currently on hi hiatus? Yeah, we're currently writing the second season. Um, and uh, so we spend a lot of time in a room with note cards staring at us. Note cards. Yeah. So I, I know you've been really busy, so even though it's hiatus, it's not really been a break for you at all then? Not really. We, no. haven't, um, we haven't really had a break. We came back from shooting and went into uh, you know, the edit room for the first season and then immediately into writing after that. Um, it was basically just a break for like about Christmas holiday. Yeah, it's it's basically a four-person team, me and Elizabeth, mm -hmm. and then our producers, uh, Hagai and Jared. And so, you know, what we figured out is if those four people can make 13 episodes of a TV show if that's all you do with your life. Mm -hmm. um, so that's <laughs> all we do with our lives is, is that. <laughs> Well, it's almost like a full-time job then. It's not really like other parts yeah. of the industry. It's yeah. where you're like hopping around. <laughs> yeah, it's like one of those like leaving the donut shop and working at the bus station. One of those. Yeah, it's like that. You I don't know when JD sees his kids. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was gonna ask that. That's I was gonna ask that later in the show. Yeah. But like you guys go on the road for this mm -hmm. show. Um, what is that like for your families? I know oh, you write that in for one of the characters that he's got a family that kind of follows him. Yeah, is those are my from, kids. Yeah. <laughs> Honestly. Oh. Yeah, yeah. No, I, uh, I. I the way that I wrote the show was so that I could bring my kids as well. And so when we shot in Madison, Wisconsin, that was really important to me. So it was actually a, a, a blessing. Mm -hmm. I grew up in Madison. So to be able to move my entire family for three months and we, we bought a, uh, we, we didn't buy a house. We rented a house. <laughs> yeah. We bought a house and, and a, <laughs> and a stadium. And no, uh, no, we, uh, we rented a house and uh, they went to school there. And, uh, you know, we, we lived as normal lives as you can uh, while also shooting a TV show. And probably working 12 to 18 hours a day. Yeah, yeah. But, it, you know, it, it it sounded like it was going to be a mistake of like, oh, you'll never see him. But man, to have that structure when you get back home of like, mm -hmm. hey, here we're having dinner, we're putting the kids to sleep. Yeah, it was really it it it's it was so important that we're making it, uh, you know, uh, a necessity in the second season. Are your um, parents from Wisconsin? Are they still there? No, my mom has moved to San Diego. But okay. uh, yeah, it was just my mom and I in Madison. Oh, okay, okay. So it's not like uh, you had this old. Did you have like the secondary family there? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I knew a lot of people from improv there, and then mm -hmm. also I had people I went to high school with. So the show is, the show itself is littered with people that I either went to high school with or people who I named characters that like if you were a mean person to me in high school you are a mean <laughs> character in the show the first interview we ever had for how we make movies um one of the writers talked about how he named a character after this girl he went to high school with and had a crush on and she ended up becoming becoming one of the integral members of how of we make movies in the very beginning yeah. so it's very funny how yeah, that yeah, sometimes yeah. comes around mm -hmm. <laughs> um so th that brings us back to high school then tell us you're from Madison. Where are you from, Elizabeth? I'm from Kentucky, Owensboro, Kentucky. Where is that? I'm from Cincinnati. <laughs> I'm like right uh, on the border. It's on the there. other side of Kentucky. Okay, the yes. other other uh, side. It's we're Western Kentucky. Oh, okay. Just on the Ohio River, like in out the or in the mountains, or no? Uh, is it a is it a city or is it just like a collection of shacks? Like, is it <laughs> do they have like a government? Is there a government or is it just like tribal? <laughs> you know, it's really funny. I don't I've never heard this bit before. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like something from a Dolly Parton song. That's why I'm asking. Winter's Bone! <laughs> no, no. no, it is a very lovely little town right on the Ohio River. And there were, you know, towns and counties much smaller than us that we could then look down on. Oh, that's good. You gotta have your competition. Yep. You know? <laughs> Civic Darwinism. So were you into acting when you were in high school? Is that how you got your start? Uh, yeah, I, I, um, the, the funny thing is I was actually born in California um, oh. and then lived in California until I was six. And while I lived in California, I wanted to be a farmer. 
<laughs> and then my family moved to Kentucky, where my dad is from, to open up a business. And it was once we got to Kentucky that I decided I did not want to be a farmer. I wanted to be an actress. Uh, so, yeah. yeah to so get I back to your roots. Yeah, community theater and, and stuff all through, even before high school, just like every... Since I was seven, I was just doing community and theater. I wanted to be a lawyer in high school. Oh, really? Yeah, I wanted to be a corporate lawyer for Citicorp. I have no idea why, but that you was wanted, specifically... You I wanted know. to make money, yeah. that's why. No, 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 no. I figured it out later. Like, that's what I wanted to do. And then I, it dawned on me one day, like, I don't want to be a lawyer. I want to play a lawyer. I don't want to <laughs> study and, like, look up, you know, drafts and be like, oh, I think... You know, Plessy versus Ferguson. I, no, I wanted to be like, isn't it true? <laughs> That's all I wanted to do. I just wanted to do that. And so then I realized, like, no, no, you want to play a lawyer. You know, you can, there's a shortcut to just doing the closing argument. I, I think I had this. <laughs> I think I had the same realization, but with a doctor. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, <laughs> so yeah. Like, I, I, was, I just want to play one on TV. I don't want <laughs> yeah. to go to med school. Yeah, um, so uh, you uh, were also, I'm sure, into theater in high school. Mm -hmm. And that's how you, I love that you guys got your start as yeah. performers. Yep. Because Ooh. so many performers end up coming to LA, trying, 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 trying for a mm -hmm. lot of years and then burning out. Mm. And you guys found a way to create your own work. Mm -hmm. And that's the ultimate win story, I think, yeah. in this town. Um, so um, how did you guys meet? Well, JD um, is, has been a working actor for a long time and uh, he owned a theater called Ultimate Improv in Westwood. And when I was in college, uh, I would come see shows. I would come mm -hmm. see JD do improv. I didn't know him, mm -hmm. but I would come and I would watch him do improv and I was impressed by it. And then uh, my best friend and my now husband and boyfriend at the time, when we graduated, decided to move to Hollywood. Oh. Uh, <laughs> uh, we, because we had been in Pomona. Uh, <laughs> when you're watching American Idol and they're like, you're going to Hollywood, you always think like, it's kind of dirty. <laughs> like, I always think like, you want to move to like Santa Monica, you're going to Santa Monica. I always feel sorry for the people who are from LA. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And like don't get a fly on a plane. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Get like, drive. Just get in your car and just come over. Yeah. Uh, but anyways, we, they, my best friend and my uh, now husband wanted to audition for the theater that we had seen JD perform at, at his theater. And so I didn't even want to do it. I had no interest in improv. Um, but I went along because I didn't want to be left out. And then it became such a huge part of my life. I met JD and he was my teacher at first. I took classes there and um, he taught me how to improvise and, and it, he'd really fostered a community in that theater. Mm -hmm. um, we were all very, very close. Like everyone became very good friends too. And uh, I'm still friends, like all my best friends are from in 2004 when I went and I auditioned at this theater and met JD and met all these people mm -hmm. and from there we just started we we built it he was kind of a mentor and then became a friend yeah we I feel like it's a lot like your guys group mm -hmm. uh, the we make movies that that you were talking about these hypothetical people who come to LA all the time and try to make it and then leave right. a lot of it is community based mm -hmm. like they just come and they're just all by themselves yeah. and and, and they just, they can't get a foothold and they don't know anybody and mm -hmm. stuff like that. And if you can build a, a, a community or be a part of a community mm -hmm. like Ultimate Improv or, or your guys' group, I just think it's a lot easier because yeah. you, can, you can find people to create with and you can, there's a support group and you just, you feel like, you know, if, if, if you're dead in your apartment for three days, somebody will notice. Yeah, you know, and, yeah uh, and somebody call. might call, yeah. Yeah, and so that's that's that was crucial, uh, yeah. I think. Um, and also just the idea of getting up and performing every week uh, was, that, I think, that's also... That's another thing, too. Just, yeah. again, you guys have done this with the show, but, like, constantly yeah, yeah. creating your own work. I, I, yes, I think that, that for me, improv has a, is a double-edged sword mm -hmm. in that I think for half of it, it's really great in building that community and being able to perform. I do also think that it satiates a need for us to create. Mm -hmm. So I think that there can be a downside to improv or performing like that every week. And what is that? And the reason why is because you are then, um, you no longer require yourself to go out and, and create something else because every Friday night without any effort, 
you are given adulation by 30 or 40 people. You have a routine. Or you just get that feedback that you crave because mm -hmm. your dad's an alcoholic in my case or whatever. <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, so, so whatever caused that is, is satiated. So then um, you end up not creating. So I just, this city to me is littered with a lot of people who are crazy talented, mm -hmm. who just never get it going, never start working. And, and uh, I, I can't help but feel like part of it is they have this thing that makes them feel like, hey, I'm doing something. Do you feel that that's also a, a good thing in a way because it gives you a chance to hone your craft? And uh, yeah, like I said, it's, it's yeah, both it's ways. Sword. For a period of time, I think right. it's great. And if you can still be creating, great. I just feel like a lot of people rely a little too much on it. Um, and then they don't create. I mean, when I talk to people at your group, I hear a lot of like, we're producing this, we're going to do this uh, yeah. festival, and we're going to... And, and I just wish there was a little bit more aspect of that. I, I yeah. found in my life that the most creative and the most talented, uh, God's hilarious joke on them it has not given them the same drive right. and determination because they just show up and are beloved. Yes. And so uh, they end up not uh, creating as much. And so uh, that to me, I think, can, can be a negative aspect. Or they are so hung up on their father being an alcoholic that mm -hmm. they can never get over it. Right, 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 right. I've gotten over it. Good. <laughs> 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 so, um, what made, what was the shift for you that caused you to kind of want to get on the other side of the camera? I I know specifically, which was um, about four years ago. Mm -hmm. I auditioned for. Uh, see, I had, I've been auditioning since, I don't know, 96. Uh, and, you know, I've made a living as being that guy from that thing that you can't remember. And, uh, I know so many guys like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, I'm that I love guy. them all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and so, yeah, and, and was, was making a good living out of it. Uh, but I had a series of auditions. Uh, I auditioned for uh, Recount, uh, 500 Days of Summer, and uh, a pilot. And it was... Um, uh, one was with a friend of mine, Mark Webb, who uh, directed 500 Days of Summer. Uh, uh, another one was with Danny Strong, who I used to audition with, who had written Recount. And then a third one was with Jason Weiner, who I had done improv with, who was one of the executive producers of Modern Family. And I realized that at some point, instead of holding on to this dream of acting, which is you kind of have this feeling of like you need to win in acting, like if you, it's you have this feeling like it's a radio contest, like hands on a hard body, and, and you're just gonna hold on to the car longer than anybody. When you get your Oscar, that's when you Yeah, 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 it's because I've been here, because I peed my pants <laughs> waiting <laughs> waiting for the other uh, contestants to drop. Yes. Um, and, uh, and then at some point, it, beco it becomes very clear that like maybe you've, you've gone on too long and you could have created in other ways and created your own projects. Yeah. And I found, found with these three people that they had done that. They right. had moved on and started. They had been performers for First, and so they Most were of them, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, okay. especially Jason and Danny, uh, yeah. absolutely. Um, and you know, it, it dawned on me like, hey, I think I need to start thinking about being on the other side of this table. Did you feel that uh, at your age? Yeah. That <laughs> that like you, you because you hadn't had that experience yet. That jumping to the other side, you'd be like, oh, I'm a newbie. I'm, I'm never. I'm, I'm start. I might as well be 18 and starting from scratch. Yeah, a little bit of that. So at, at my theater, we started doing video contests. You know, we'd take a theme and we'd have a week to make it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, like a, a documentary yeah. for a week or or uh, you know a, a science fiction, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And you'd make a little three or four minute movie. Yeah, I have to give credit to Channel 101 and Dan Harmon for building that model of like, hey, just creating and producing Love Dan stuff Harmon. like that. Yeah, yeah, he's the best. He's the best. So. Um, uh, that that gave me a little bit more confidence uh, to start getting into writing and creating and stuff like that. And then I worked, uh, at the same time, I also worked on the 2004 Kerry campaign. Mm -hmm. um, so I had... Are you a libertarian? Uh, no, no, no. Oh. No, no. John Kerry is a Democrat, oh, I thought I'm you said, sure. I, th I thought you meant Drew Kerry. I yeah, like... Drew, on the Drew Kerry <laughs> campaign? <laughs> when he ran for Funniest Guy? <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, <laughs> Uh, no. Uh, <laughs> when Drew Carey invaded <laughs> Poland, that campaign. No. Um, I was like, I missed that. Did he mm. run in Cleveland? <laughs> That'd be hilarious. No. Um, I, uh, I, I really enjoyed the experience of working on a campaign. I kind of experienced what it was like to be on the road. And so, but what was interesting is at the end of the process, my, the guy who kind of took me under his wing uh, while I was working on the campaign, 
he, I went back home to my family and to my normal life, and he went on up to Michigan to do something called voter suppression. And I was so oh, fascinated. That sounds, that sounds really I know, Orwellian. doesn't it? It's, it's, <laughs> yes, it's Orwellian. And so uh, I felt like it was uh, um, kind of interesting that he spends his life just moving from campaign to cam campaign. And I wanted to know what that was like. Mm -hmm. How do you build families and communities, which is you, what you and I were just talking about. And, um, and that's where the, the genesis of the idea came from. Mm, excellent. I was really surprised by it too, with you guys both coming from a comedy background, that you would choose to go into a dramedy. And I, I watched the show, and there are, you know, humorous moments that come from those human life, you know, little idiosyncrasies. But yeah, yeah. most of it is actually very heavy. I yeah, think. yeah. I, well, I think part of it also is just the the fear of the idea of like, hey, I'm going to write a comedy where there's going to be two jokes a page and I just never wanted to give myself that um, pressure mm -hmm. so instead I just write what I think is interesting and what I find uh, uh, fascinating about this world right. and I want the people to be aware of when they're being funny with each other that's how they talk to each other just yeah. like how we talk to each other in improv groups Absolutely. I wanted to have that kind of I wanted to have that vibe do you use a lot of improv in the show it yeah. seems very off the cuff yeah I mean we I definitely want to build you know, I, I worked I worked uh, uh, two days on on Bad Boys Two and and got to be screamed at by Michael Bay, um, <laughs> which I know I'm in good company. Um, but uh, you know, and I felt like I was ruining his movie at all times, mm -hmm. uh, the small part, uh, because he had already him and Will Smith and Martin Lawrence had already. Uh, I came in late in the production, so uh, they had already built this relationship on marshland. Of, of not fighting with each other, and so they weren't allowed to yell at each other, so I was the only person who could be yelled at. Oh, no. So he, he kind of zeroed in on me like a Goldfinger laser. Um, and uh, so, so yeah, so I, I wanted to make sure that I never let actors feel that way of like that they're ruining the production. So I, I really am okay with that feeling of, hey, just make it your own, and, and if you want to change the words, that's that's fine. And and then we also, at the end of every take, or every uh, uh, scene, do an unusable take, mm -hmm. uh, where they're allowed to do anything that they want. They can they can go out of their minds, whatever it is that they want to do, and I think that just frees them to know, like, hey, it's really not important, this specific moment. You can, you can the more relaxed you are mm -hmm. as a performer, the better your performance is going to be. So you would can definitely consider yourself, that I'm sure, the actor's director. I'm trying. I don't yeah. know. I think that's that's really is. Yeah. yeah. He, he absolutely is. Uh, one of the things that JD used to have hanging in his his theater at Ultimate Improv was a little plaque that says, "What would you do if you knew you could not fail?" And I really I feel like JD lives his life by mm -hmm. that. Um, you asked him if it was difficult to move from being an actor into being a producer and a director and a writer and I'm I, sure that'd be so intimidating. I feel like he's with such grace. Like I feel like he just was like. I'm just gonna do this. Like that's it's what it looks like to me. Like I know that there are probably steps, but it was like, and and as as an actor in the show, and just um, since I also play a small part, and I think I can speak on behalf of the other actors in Battleground. If it's positive, yeah. <laughs> JD Walsh can suck a big one. <laughs> that is so true. Right. That's what I'm going for. I can suck a big one. <laughs> Do you no. put that on your resume? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Under your special skills? No, that's my name. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, but he, he creates an environment that is incredibly comfortable. And uh, he writes a script that is is great. And mm -hmm. it's words that the actors want to say. But then there also is this feeling of like, I don't have to nail it. I don't have to get it perfect. Yeah. The only thing that's going to make JD mad is if I stop and apologize. Oh. Like, just don't stop. Just yeah keep going with it and just be a real person because real people sometimes stutter stutter mm -hmm. and yeah. real people sometimes can't think of a word and it happens and just to go with it yeah. because you'll sometimes find the best moments yeah. right after when you do like what you think is a huge mistake and in those moments like the, so many of those moments yeah. are in our show i mean we're all looking for that mark ruffalo grabbing the fly moment <laughs> in uh, uh, it, it, you can't take it with you. Is that right? Is that the name of the movie? You can count on me. You can count on me. Where he gra That's. I mean that. That is somebody who is. Hey, I'm just here right now, just talking. Yeah. And if you can build that world, if you can, if you can build a a, a feeling that whether it be on stage or whether it be in front of the camera of uh, I'm I'm really okay with this being uh, just fine. Yeah. You know, and not and not feeling like one of the things about improv and acting is you can't try harder 
you can only be you can pre you can prepare more huge, yeah. you can pre I'm all about preparation right. but you know what they didn't know when I would go in for those auditions is that my effortlessness mm -hmm. with the lines was 10 hours of preparation so that moment I walked through the door I just seemed like oh I just kind of had these lines and oh yeah, you know what I'm saying like where did you train originally I, I went to UCLA for theater mm -hmm. um, and then from there uh, moved on to improv theaters I, I kind of hit every improv theater here I felt um, from my training that I, I was uh, I started with Meisner yeah and, and then I you know did Adler and you know a bunch yeah. of other techniques and then have kind of moved into yeah. uh, improv I feel like it's all the same thing just different wording in a way it's just like living in the moment and like creating this reality and yeah and letting this be what it is I think that you know our experience from casting I mean it is you hear it a lot when people say like hey, just go through casting one time and you learn so much. I think the thing that we learned the most is we would have these people come in with huge resumes and just like the best schools uh, oh, yeah. in, in, the, in the country and, and amazing um, training. But what, what that was built on was nerves. Mm -hmm. And so they would come in and no matter what their training was, it was all about, um, they, were, they were so nervous. And this was at the time we were a, a web series that right. nobody had ever heard of and it was for very little money so it's about as low stakes as you can get when it comes to theatrical auditions right. I mean we weren't auditioning in the valley which was always a red flag for me yeah. but, uh, uh, but you know will you take your shirt yeah, off yeah, yeah, yeah. I, didn't, I didn't have those but <laughs> I guess we lived two different paths uh, I, mine was always could you put your shirt back on <laughs> no <laughs> it's my process uh, so uh, so they would come in and they would be so nervous and uh, uh, I just if I was going to teach acting again if I was going if I was going to really build a theater I all I would I wouldn't work on technique at all I would just work on nerves yeah I would just you know I would just create an environment where people come in and feel nervous going in so that like when I would go for a network test mm -hmm. I would get five or six of my friends who I admired, who were the funniest people I knew, and said, hey, could you come to my house? Or I would go to their house, yeah. and I just want to do the lines for you, because I'd be so nervous in front of them of yeah. like, hey, this guy's really funny, you know, and get the shaky hand going. Yeah. And I knew that if I could do the lines there, and if I could deliver there, that when I walked in in front of Les Moonves, I would be able to deliver that, uh, that uh, um, performance. From your own experiences as actors, have you come up with any ticks uh, tricks, ticks? Yeah. Tricks, <laughs> uh, tricks or techniques um, for easing your own nerves? Uh, yes. Where do you go? What, what do you What do you have? Um, I at this point I try to talk to the other actors in the room beforehand. That helps me. Sometimes I walk into a room and I feel like I haven't spoken to another human being in like hours like I feel like I've only just been saying the lines to myself in my head over and over again especially if it's the first audition of the day mm -hmm. maybe you haven't even spoken out loud yet yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean that happens all the time yeah. you wake up and you know you, your husband or your wife has gone to work or whatever yeah, yeah. and like you haven't spoken to a soul and so I found that like that is helpful for me just like to show up and be like even if I don't know somebody just try to talk to somebody <laughs> just like just a little little chit chat so that when you go into the room the person who is uh, auditioning you is not the first person yeah. you've spoken to that day. Um, what's what's I, the worst audition you ever had, Elizabeth? <laughs> 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 well, I once was called in, uh, it was a commercial audition, and uh, they had told me that they had ahead of time, the, make sure you show up at the time that you were called because they had prepared the people uh, who were auditioning together. And so I show up to the place and I'm um, like, oh, I wonder. I wonder who they prepared me with. Like that'll be really interesting to know who they think I look like I should be with. Uh, and JD shows up. Bing! <laughs> and that was your worst audition ever. And <laughs> we we know each other. Yeah, we yeah, are yeah. Friends. We have done improv together yeah, yeah. for years. And it's just a, it's a commercial audition. Yeah, yeah. Like, it's, it Don't go in with your friends really? because yeah, you're super <laughs> hyper aware of like one not wanting to sell out and one wanting to be good and you're totally not connecting with the other person <laughs> you know funny. what i'm saying yeah you definitely are in uh different worlds wow it's, i did i my it was it was an actual another audition i had that was just fine but but was uh, such a clear example of hollywood for me as i auditioned i tested for a show called uh fighting fitzgeralds mm -hmm. and uh, to be brian dennehy's son and at the at the end of the audition, there's studio and there's network. So if you do well at studio, then you get to go to network, which is the World Series. And uh, 
You won. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> so the goal of all us actors is to make it to network. Right. That's the big deal. And uh, so I was at studio, and I, d I felt so good about the audition mm -hmm. that uh, I almost high-fived all the assistants as I walked <laughs> down the hallway. Like, I almost went, boom, 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 boom. That's how good I felt about it. And then I had a commercial audition, oddly in the valley, foreshadowing, um, <laughs> where uh, I, I went to the audition, and as I was walking into the audition, my manager called, and uh, he said, uh, he said, we didn't get it. You're not moving forward. Um, and I was like, uh, I like, he says, we didn't get it. Because oh, yeah. it, 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 it makes it feel like the royal we. Uh, but uh, uh, I didn't get it. Yeah. Um, and uh, so then I, I didn't get to go to network that afternoon. And I walked into the audition. And it was a Pepsi audition where you had to take your shirt off and dance. <laughs> and so never to, have you the, went to the valley and you had to take I know your it's shirt crazy off. isn't it that that I was able to see all of Hollywood in 2 hours <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying I'm at the top of the moon You were talking about you were talking about um, uh, auditioning um, tricks. Uh, I think the biggest thing, uh, yes, Anning, what she was saying is the idea of saying the lines with somebody. Man, my wife. You know, you get people uh, and when they win Emmys and they're like, "Gotta thank my wife," and and you're like, "Oh." And then there's the people that forget to thank their wife. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> you know, uh, that you kind of feel like, oh, they're just doing that so that the uh, person's not mad at them at home. Yeah. No, my wife for uh, for the last. 12 years has been there every theatrical audition, running those lines, not complaining. I know it's not fun. I know it's not easy. Dealing with my like anger when I'm, uh, for some reason, when I'm running lines, I get super anxious and angry mm -hmm. and, you know, uh, dealing with all of that. Um, and so when I walk into an audition, I've already done the lines a hundred times. Mm -hmm. And we used to do things, we used to have my wife uh, 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 mess with me because. Casting directors always do weird shit mm -hmm. when you're in auditions. Yeah. Like, they, you know, they're eating Chinese food or, you know, they're playing darts while you're <laughs> auditioning. And so, you know, I, my, I would come into the room, we'd, we'd pretend that I was walking in the room and, and my wife would, uh, like, not have a chair for me to sit in or, like, <laughs> would stand up right next to me and do the lines. And, and just, just so that no matter what happened in that audition, I would get used to yeah. uh, auditioning uh, and, and, and feeling uh, nervous. But I think the best trick that, that, that I learned was an was a idea that Jason Weiner and I uh, both came up with. His was organic, which was he was auditioning with Anna Faris for a, a talking dog show. No <laughs> joke, just again, a coincidence. Um, and uh, he was uh, walking into the room and, and they were laughing as they were going down the hallway. And so then when he walked into the, uh, into the audition room, it was perfect. Like they were, you know, they, they, he was kind of happy when he walked into the room. And so I took that very awesome, real moment mm -hmm. and created a very false narrative for whenever I walk into auditions. Mm -hmm. And I, I'd like to show it to you. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Let me get a performance. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, hey, guys. <laughs> I'm laughing at nothing. I'm laughing at a filing cabinet. <laughs> but immediately, they want to know yeah, what it is the, you're the, laughing at. That's that era of mystery. The idea is like, hey, my life's a party. I'm just having fun. I'm going to stroll in, do this thing, go back to my world. There's, a, there's a, that bit of like, they want to know. I had an acting teacher once tell me, um, every audition you go to, always have a secret. And it doesn't matter what it is, yeah, it, yeah. it just gives you that air of mystery and, and they yeah, just yeah. want to like lean in a little mm -hmm. bit. He's like, mine is, I always fart right before I go in the room. <laughs> and I, I smell it and I'm like, yeah. I know it's me. That's and crazy. like, he'll like have this little smile on his yeah, face yeah, when he's yeah. ready to audition. <laughs> like, he just comes in going like this, hey guys, what's going on? <laughs> that's his secret, that's his secret. What if it follows him into the room? <laughs> and he that's just does the door theory. thing for you guys. <laughs> So okay, so yes. we did, you know, cover the acting thing. Yep. Um, we, we talked about what made you want to shift into being on the other side of the camera. Um, she talked about how you seem to have this unwavering confidence. How did all this actually happen? I mean, this is your first thing that you really yeah. wrote, and you, you I, I saw on your IMDb, you have no other writing credits, yeah, no true. other directing credits, true. no other executive producing credits, and then bam. 
Yeah, um, so I started writing it, yeah. and uh, you know, uh, my friend Mark, who I went to school with in elementary school, he was very supportive uh, of it, mm -hmm. and um, you know, I told him the concept, and he was like, "Hey, you know, after 500 days of summer, I'm getting some meetings, so you should you should finish that." And I was like, "If if not that, if that can't if that can't make me finish a project, then mm -hmm. then what will?" So right. that made me finish finish the script. And what happened was is that I had a couple friends who had agents, and I, 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 I think my, my take is is you get one shot with your friends who have agents. Right. So make sure it's a good shot. You right. know, make sure it is like, hey, I, I know this is awkward, but I'd love for you to read this script. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Because they're not going to read a second script, especially right. if the first one's not good. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so I had them read it. And a guy really liked it, uh, and he said, "Hey, can I show this to my agent at CAA?" And I said, "No." He asked you. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Of course, I said, "Yeah." And uh, uh, and uh, it, it went to CAA. They they really liked it. They went to production uh, houses with it, and I was like, "This is the rocket ship." <laughs> Goodbye, commercial acting. <laughs> um, and uh, then none of the production houses uh, liked it. None of the you know producers liked it, um, or you know it's this. Politics, uh, that that kind of uh, uh, red badge that that is on politics, or yeah. it's, it's essentially like, oh, it's a leukemia comedy. Um, it's, <laughs> it's got a, it's got that kind of vibe yeah, to yeah. it. So, so then we went to. Uh, so then it was dead. It was dead. Um, oh, and no. uh, I was like, oh, okay. Um, and and I started thinking to myself, like I had made some money in commercials, so mm -hmm. I thought, all right, well. This script is not the greatest script, but it's right. not a terrible script. So let's say that it is equal to a average show on television. Something, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, absolutely. And so let's lots of shows I don't watch. Yeah, yeah, exactly. All those posters for USA Network shows yeah. with one-word names like that. Yeah. That I don't know what that is. I don't know what Suits is about, but right. you know what I'm saying. So uh, but besides the obvious. Right. Um, and uh, so um, so I was like, all right, uh, let's. Um, uh, let, let's go and direct this. So I I, uh, I put together twenty thousand dollars. I called my mom and my uncle. Again, you get one shot uh, with them to say like, hey, could you give me some money? Uh, and they gave me twenty thousand dollars. And we went to Madison and we filmed it. We filmed it in yeah. four days. And you know that was I think the the real moment. That that was the moment where now I had something tangible. Mm -hmm. You know I had some. You know we this is what we spent our money on. We spent our money on a good editor. Yes great sound mm -hmm. and a DP. Those were the most important things. Everything else, the actors worked for free. You know, we, we put them up in a, apartments with friends. I mean, everything else was as cheap as you could be, mm -hmm. but an editor, a DP, um, and uh, sound. Th yeah. Those were the most important. Yeah. I, th I think so many people underestimate how important sound is. Yeah. No, that needs to be said again. Yeah. People <laughs> underestimate how mm -hmm. how important sound yeah. is. It is it is crucial to your movie. It immediately, mm -hmm. uh, without the audience really sometimes getting it, uh, it uh, uh, marginalizes like, your show. Yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. And uh, when you hear that kind of echoey thing, so uh, I was like, all right, so so we made it. I I showed it to my uh, managers. They dug it. Showed it to Mark, who had liked the script, but mm -hmm. was like, I don't know what to do with this, but it's a nice script. Right. And all of a sudden, he was like, Hey, let me take this to my agents. And that's when it changed. Now, what I feel bad about in this story, because I know from uh, I know what it's like to be like, hey, what's the path? And I understand that this path has a giant golden bridge over it, which is I was friends with Mark Webb, who directed Spider Man. I get that. But that that also comes with you worked for how many years as yeah. an actor and built those contacts, working your ass off in Hollywood. Yes. You know. Yeah. I mean, it 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 definitely helped, but but there was also something tangible to give him in yeah. that moment, where he was able to uh, to, to move it on. So right. because of uh, Spider Man, we were able to bring it into Fox, right. and Fox, uh, I think, really just wanted to be in the business with Mark Webb. I mm -hmm. think the idea was okay, mm -hmm. um, and we it was it was a really good experience with Fox. You all, I grew up on the Larry Sanders show, so I, I thought it was going to be network notes that were nightmares, and it was actually a very wonderful experience Positive. all the way to where they didn't make it. <laughs> um, but they were so nice about it. They were super nice about it, and and I thought I thought that that it was going to be dead. Mm -hmm. And but here's like I think an important piece of the story is that uh, Mark's friend Hagai, who had been part of the uh, the show before we had gone to Fox, we were taking it around to different production companies and stuff like that, um, had been a part of the uh, of the team behind it, and Fox had had pushed him out. 
You know, they said, oh, we don't know who this guy is, and it's just you and Mark and stuff like that. They just didn't want to pay him. Right. And, uh, and that was an uncomfortable phone call. Mm -hmm. But after it had died at, at Fox, a guy called, and I don't think I would have ever done this. I don't think I ever would have had the balls to call up and say like, hey, I really believe in this project. I'd like to come back on board. I have this friend at Hulu who's looking for original programming. Can you can we do it? And because he did that, mm -hmm. um, that's what got us to Hulu, and that's what got it, you know, going from there. And I think that so what it was that friend that had been slighted, but yeah. still. Loved and I think you that you need project. to do that in the city. Yeah. I think that there has to be some sort of like swallowing the pride and just being like, I'm just going to get back up again. Yeah. I really do like. The city Knocking will give you every reason to hate it. And the only way that I am able to deal with it in this city is I just see it as a giant practical joke by Hollywood. <laughs> so that I'm constantly like, that's a good one. <laughs> that's a good one, Hollywood. You really made me cry there. <laughs> wow. I'm full, I'm full of self-loathing and doubt. Thank you, Hollywood. I'm actually pointing at the Hollywood sign, literally, literally and figuratively right now. Um, and uh, so I, uh, so, but he, you know, he was able to uh, do it and that's what got us to Hulu. But I think what helped at Hulu, mm -hmm. and I think that this is, is crucial, is I, we had a lot of things going for ourselves. One, we had a pilot and they, they were able to see it. Mm -hmm. So they, it wasn't just a concept, it was right. like, this is what it's gonna look like. You believed in yourself enough to invest in the project. Yeah, exactly, yeah. but also they were able to not just, uh, I didn't have to explain, like, you know, it's kind of like The Office, but it's also The West Wing. <laughs> it, they were able to see the tone of the show, and I think that that's what was important to them. Mm -hmm. Two, we had a pilot script already written. Mm -hmm. uh, three, Haggai, the producer, this <laughs> is important, is to make sure you get a guy who's on your team who's good at production and is good at money and just gets the whole world mm -hmm. and is able to, what they were able to see in our team was the idea of this dude's gonna write it and this dude's gonna produce it right. and if we give him X amount of dollars, we're going to get this. Yeah. And that was crucial. I think also it helped that Mark Webb's name was attached to it so that there was some sort of like press release of it. Um, I think that, that helped and then in the end, I think they also liked it. But those other aspects, especially the producer part. I love that part. you put that at the very, very, very end. Yeah. And they might have liked it. Yeah. <laughs> like all I mean, these other things lined up, and they probably Yeah, but don't it. we kind of go through life yes. like that, just feeling yeah. like people just are like, okay with what you did? I mean, we rarely are just like, man, we're awesome. You know what I'm saying? Because <laughs> yeah. we don't want to be those crazy people who think they're awesome, that are yeah. talentless. You know how the city is just kind of full, <laughs> full of, of like those. people who just yeah. have websites and flyers, and I got this show, and, and you just know it's just surrounding a piece of poop? Yeah. And I just never wanted to be that guy. I'm always a little jealous of those people, though. Yes. I'm like, yeah. why? If I only had no, no, that's a good sign. Confidence. That's a good sign. That means you're talented. Oh, good. Yeah. Oh, good. Yeah. No, at what point, Elizabeth, did you get into the show? Or were you brought on board? Uh, well, I actually, uh, when JD had called his mom and his uncle and got that $20,000 to shoot that pilot, I actually auditioned to be the unpaid actor uh, <laughs> shooting his pilot in Madison, and I did not get the part. Oh, ouch. Uh, yeah. <laughs> just as a vendetta. She was good enough. I just didn't, I just wasn't being mean. <laughs> um, so that was actually my first, that was when I first came in contact with it, and I, I read the script, and I thought his pilot that he wrote was amazing, and um, and then, you know, for a while, nothing, from my perception, nothing was really happening mm -hmm. with it. Um, and then... And you were doing tons of commercial auditions and TV yeah, auditions in the meantime? Yeah, I was just trying to work as an actress, mm -hmm. um, mostly in commercials. It's mostly the work that I've done and um, just trying to live my life as an, as an actress in the city, which yeah. is tough. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and doing improv and, mm -hmm. and, you know, at the theater. And I am a part of an improv, an all-female improv group um, called Token Boy. Plug and, it. What's the website? Uh, just go to Facebook and look at Token Boy. <laughs> <laughs> we haven't updated our website in a long time because we're not. Means they're people. talented. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're on to something. Uh, oh, I know I'm on to something. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, you know, all of the girls in, in Token Boy were all a part of JD's theater, too. So JD knew us and, and we were uh, close with him. And he actually approached us about writing something different together, like a completely different oh, yeah. show, which we did. We. Um, and I had never really just thought that I wanted to write or anything. Right. I remember at the meetings kind of being like, all right, like, I'll do this because mm -hmm. I want to be an actor in it. But, yeah. like, I don't really want to write. And then I ended up writing a lot. Like, I felt, and I, and I enjoyed the process and learned a lot from JD from writing with him for that pilot. And, um, and that didn't end up going anywhere. We filmed it and, and it didn't, nothing really happened. So you, you helped pilot. with his pilot? 
we did in the interim of while this was going through Fox and all that kind of stuff. I was like, well, you know, it's yes, it, it sounds good on paper, like oh, it's a three three day or I'm sorry, three year travel up to the top of the mountain. But it's uh, it's actually you have a lot of free time in that mm -hmm. in that time while you're waiting. And so I started doing you know like every six months like a different pilot mm -hmm. um, where we'd write the pilot and then we'd spend a weekend. We'd get a good DP and a good sound guy and a good editor. That's great. And and uh, and shoot it. Uh, and so the, one of those shows that we made was uh, called The Nanny Club and she helped me write it. And I, and, and it, it worked so well, her mm -hmm. and I working together, that I was like, when Battleground turned into something, I was like, hey, would you like to come on as, as one of the writers? That's how it happened. Yeah. yeah. That's how it happened. So since then, I saw on the IMDb that you helped with two episodes, but are, are you doing more than that now? Um, I have a... a Co like a co-writing credit on three of the episodes okay. from the from the first season, first season. and um, you know I worked as a co-producer. So I was there during all the production, and it's actually probably one of my favorite parts of it was getting to sit next to JD at the monitors and get to see him direct the actors and put in my two cents whenever yeah. you know, I wanted to. JD. It's really important to have somebody that you can talk to about mm -hmm. like, hey, I'm thinking this and. You know, I'm, I, I, I do have a lot of confidence in, in me being able to see things and performances and stuff like that, but I don't see it all. Right. Uh, and she catches those things, and also occasionally I'm wrong, and so she can catch catch those things as well. So, so you the, were with him behind the monitor the entire first season? Yeah. Ex and except for the few uh, moments where I was in front of the cameras, because I did play a small part. Um, he finally cast me. <laughs> it's about time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, so yeah, so that was that was mainly what I did, and that, and then you know I I stuck around and helped with you know I was in the edit room too. I got to watch all the footage, and mm -hmm. JD of course does all the notes and does the really hands-on stuff. But I also got to play a part. I got to give him my opinion. Yeah. Uh, and so it was it was really fun being a part. Of I, I think a big everybody. piece of it to just kind of brought out is is to build a an excellent team around you like yeah. I'm betting on Elizabeth mm -hmm. I'm betting on Elizabeth as a talent and as as uh, um, as a creator and somebody who I can bounce ideas off of I'm betting on Jared and guy as those people as well but also from a, uh, a production standpoint mm -hmm. and if you can build that team you got to hold them tight and be like, hey, let's just keep working because this is working. This system is working, right. and that's lightning in a bottle. Right. You know what I'm saying? There's times where I'm sure we're going to get on each other's nerves, but in comparison to, uh, you know, you're trying to do a shoot this weekend, and the people that you decide to do it with are like, no, we're going to Coachella this weekend. <laughs> you're like that. That is that is a very common thing in the city, and if yeah. you can get people that you believe in who and are dedicated, talented, it's rare. So rare in the city. Now, um, you've kind of made the switch from acting to producing and writing. Do you see yourself going further with producing and writing? Um, or are you still like, oh, I really have this other dream? Um, I still want to be an actor, and I don't feel like, I don't feel like in this age you have to pick one. I think yeah. you can do, do them all. Like, I want to work on Battleground for as long as I can because I believe in the project, mm -hmm. and I like working with JD, and... Um, and Haggai and Jared and and so I want to do all three of those I want to be an actor writer producer for as long as I can on this show and then yeah eventually like I, I'd like to you know I have my own ideas for things that I'd like to write and um, and kind of step into more of a JD role like what JD this is his mm -hmm. baby and someday I, I want to have my baby you know yeah. that, that feels like mine but no my desire to be an actress has not gone away and and uh, and I don't feel like it's something that I have to choose between. Like I feel like I've I've had to put acting a little on the black back burner when I'm busy, when I'm writing, and you know there's been auditions that I can't make it to because we're just doing other things. But it's not something that's gone on in my life completely, and I don't think it has to. Yeah, I don't have to act ever again. Really? I really don't. I really don't. You're, I, you're satisfied I enjoyed, with your I enjoyed journey? doing Two and a Half Men and being in front of a live audience mm -hmm. and doing it then and the excitement of that. Yeah. But but doing a one hour drama where you're shooting one scene for 12 hours and you're just kind of standing there just watching the lead talk for 12 hours I don't I don't really need it's nice when people come up to you and say mm -hmm. like hey I saw your thing that is nice yeah but I don't need it I right. don't need it anymore um, but that's just my personal journey um, as, as writers you were just talking about eventually one day having your baby and mm -hmm. you know doing the hula thing how important is it for you to maintain the rights of your own work and I think that's really what kind of defines the independent spirit as like I 
have this idea, I have, I have this thing that I, w I have to make and I, I want to make it and see it all the way through. Mm -hmm. uh, would, would you like write something just to, to sell it and give it to someone else or do you really like... Oh yeah, I mean it depends on the money. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, <laughs> yeah, if they wanted to pay me to do some sort of like uh, 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 studio a blockbuster about how the trees are attacking us and pay me a million dollars, yeah, I'd be into it. Uh, <laughs> but that's not, but I, I was also able to hold up a can of Pepsi for years and just be like, mmm, delicious, and get paid. So I sold out in 96. Uh, so so uh, I, I just have been able to compartmentalize that that in, in my mind, that's not my life. That's not, that's not who I am, being either a commercial actor or, or a writer for hire is not who I am. My life is uh, what I create and my family and my friends. So it's, I, 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 never, I never connect the two. Mm -hmm. With that said, I wish that I was somebody with, let's say, Battleground that I was able to uh, just be like, oh yeah, let's make that cut or let's, let's cast this person because it would make it smoother mm -hmm. uh, process for everybody uh, involved. Um, but I'm I'm unable to do that. I I, I feel so strongly about uh, uh, my uh, my point of view that that I'm unable. I'm I'm definitely able to compromise when it comes to process mm -hmm. of like, hey, you want to have meetings and we do this and like, hey, is it okay if we do another round of notes? I'm all for that. Right. But if it's something that I uh, believe in in a specific moment, I'm not able to just say like, yeah, sure, it's good, because I, I, I know I will regret it the rest of my life. We have some um, questions from the audience. Great. The first one is from a Twitter follower at C. Uh, what do you think web versus TV programming will look like in three to five years? Yeah, I think that there's been a big shift in the last year. I think now, uh, and I think you're going to see it even more next year with uh, um, you know more shows coming out that are specifically made for the web. Uh, for me, arrested I've, development. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, I think the big moment for me was the moment where my wife was able to sit on a couch with me mm -hmm. and watch our TV that was hooked up to the internet mm -hmm. and watch her shows. You know, as long as she can watch Army Wives sitting on the couch <laughs> while on the TV, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. As opposed to what was happening two years ago, right. three years ago, uh, where you would sit at a kitchen table with your laptop kind of watching yeah. your, your show. Mm -hmm. I think that you're going to see more people making shows for it because it's going to be the exact same as whether you're making a show for, let's say, the Sundance channel. I think that you're going to start seeing people change from this dynamic, and I don't know why it's still going on, where uh, web series need to be five minutes, seven minutes long. Mm -hmm. Like I keep hearing about this this new internet boom of television, but when you go into the what the programming is, often it's five minute, seven minute shows, and I, I don't think that that's the route. I think yeah. that we've proven that you are able to make a 22 minute show, possibly even a 44 minute show. Mm -hmm. my, my mom doesn't know what network Friday Night Lights was on, but she knows that it's on uh, Hulu, so she watches it, and she just watches it straight through. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And, and that, is a, that is a monumental shift in, in television, so I, I think that that's what you're going to see yeah. more and more. Um, this one's also for JD from Tim McCook. He said, as a UW-Madison alumni, I'm curious about how your Wisconsin roots informed your voice and also how the UW Alumni Support Net Network is in LA. Great. Um, I didn't go to Wisconsin um, because my mom was a professor at Wisconsin and Ooh. I was worried that she was going to knock on my dorm <laughs> uh, door at any moment in my life, so I, I, I left. No, I have uh, very fond memories of Madison. I grew up there. Um, I, I do think that there's a, a, a great comedy um, uh, environment there. That's where the onion started. There's a lot mm -hmm. of improv there, uh, and and I set the show there. And mainly why I set the show there was so that I could, uh, when I was writing, it was just a lot easier to just come up with the name of a park that I had gone to school with, uh, that I had done when I was in elementary school, mm -hmm. than to actually do research. So uh, <laughs> so that was a lot easier. It was then very weird to two months later bring a, an entire crew to the park that I had grown up at to shoot a scene was a very Did weird. Did you cast and crew everyone out of LA and then bring them We to found a lot of people that, uh, you know, yeah, we'll get into the depths of production. We, uh, we, cast, um, we cast people in LA, Milwaukee, Madison, and Chicago. And uh, I would say 
that if you were going to do this, if we were going to do it again, mm -hmm. for parts where you have to be funny and you have uh, uh, some real lines, you want to go to either uh, Chicago, LA, or New York. You can find uh, people um, in the city that you're going to to film that will be fine, but you have to look at a hundred of them to find two or three of them. The, we found some have, great. They, they just don't have the experience. Yeah, That's and the also they would show up on set and think that we were shooting Lord of the Rings. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like they were just like, oh my God, this is the biggest thing I've ever done in my life. Yeah. And I was like, it's, you know, right now it's a web series, so let's calm it down. So yeah, so there definitely was, there's definitely that hump that we had to overcome with people being like, ah, you know? <laughs> Yeah, uh, this one's from Robert Bang. He said, what is your average budget for a typical webisode of Battleground? Well, I would say, you know, they, they'll they kill me if I say the actual name, so I, I'll be happy to tell him after this. Okay, um, that was Robert uh, Bang. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll be happy to tell him. I would say it's the same as, as a, a, a independent movie uh, that would be excited to get into Sundance. Okay. You know what I'm saying? Like, oh, we got into Sundance. Uh, and uh, so, but... We were, I mean, everybody got paid, yeah. but it wasn't, it wasn't like, uh, hey, quit your day job. It was get done with filming, go back to your day job. Right. Because um, it, it's one of those things, it's still for web and not for network. So the, even with the sponsorships, the, it's not going to be as... Yeah, right now. But right. I mean, there's more money going into these shows. Yeah. And I think we were one of the first shows that had a legitimate budget. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? But we still had to film... 13 episodes mm -hmm. in seven or eight weeks. Uh -huh. And that's 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 not easy. So we filmed <laughs> it like it was a movie. Mm -hmm. We filmed 375 pages where we just, you know, uh, uh, you know, where we would shoot out of order and all that kind of stuff mm -hmm. because that's where we had to save money. Yeah. Yeah. This one's from at Eric D. Altman. He says, do you find that being a hyphenate writer, producer, director uh, has helped propel you forward along your career paths? Um, yeah, I know after Battleground for me, like, uh, I was able to actually get meetings with people, like, who <laughs> wanted to meet with me. Like, you know, as an actor, you struggle for a long time just to get into a room, and oftentimes when you get in the room to meet an agent or a manager, they're not even that nice to you. Yeah. Um, and so that was nice, having someone call me out of the blue <laughs> and be like, hey, you want to you wanna go get a drink? And me being like, all right, and then buying me a drink, and then being like, I want to work with you. I mean, that... That was nice. It definitely changed that for me. It opened some doors. Yeah. I, I do think that because um, I, I, I feel like with improv, I stayed at the party a little too long. Uh -huh. I you know I ran this improv theater for ten years. Yeah. Um, and I just kind of feel like you know if if everything had gone really well with the improv theater, like we were just killing it, mm -hmm. I'd probably make about twenty thousand dollars a year. So it's <laughs> not a money making operation. Um, and so I feel like I stayed a little too long at the party. With that said, I do know that I use the skills that I that I gained from teaching improv and talking about improv and talking about art and having a point of view of art mm -hmm. that I use uh, those same skills when I'm meeting with uh, people who are intimidating and scary. You know, whether it be network executives or people at CAA, I still have that same uh, confidence. As long as we stay in my realm of being able to make it sound like I know what I'm talking about when really I'm just talking about improv and changing the words. And uh, also, walking in the door laughing helps. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> Depends what the filing cabinet says. <laughs> <laughs> this one is also from at C. Kukahiko. Uh, he says, how long and circuitous, <laughs> you thought I wouldn't be able to pronounce it, was Hulu's green lighting process? Um, it's a, uh, it was a little hard because they, they had never really done this before, so we had to start from scratch of what what the deal was going to be. Um, but you know, Mark Webb told me uh, that when I was kind of calling him and saying like, oh, we're still waiting for the official green light. Was it helpful to have him on your side? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, yeah, to, to talk about it. And yeah. he said that, you know, and this was like a year ago, he said that he was still waiting for 500 days of summer to get greenlit. That that you it's such a good movie. That's yeah, yeah. so sad to think that they had to wait. They had to wait, and and no, no, but that they never got the official word. It's it's kind of like walking into the ocean, and then realize like, oh look, we're we're underwater now. <laughs> you know, like that that uh, that is a bit of the process. I I mean, I, I joke with the Hulu people that I would like the moment where we just clink glasses and we're like, yay, we're all greenlit. But it's a very slow process, and you yeah. don't know when it's going to happen. And 
It's very tough. From start to finish, from the point where you started writing it to the mm -hmm. point where you started your first day of production. Uh, we're starting writing the original pilot, uh -huh. like at McDonald's. Yeah. Because I, I would shoot, I would write at McDonald's because they have free soda, <laughs> and they have free Wi-Fi. Yes. So it's great. So if you could put some <laughs> headphones in, yeah, it's really really nice. It's yeah. Better than Starbucks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so um, yeah, and there's not other writers there. Right. Yeah. <laughs> no one to compete yeah. with or look over yeah, your yeah, shoulder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like uh, maybe some like intellectuals <laughs> slash homeless people. You're not really <laughs> sure. <laughs> what's you going and the homeless on. dude in the back. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, uh, that process was uh, two and a half years. Wow. Okay. Um, yeah. But again, it sounds like every day I was doing it, but it wasn't. I was doing so other things. So lots of hurry and, up and wait. Yeah, yeah, a lot of that. This one's from Andy Gala. He said, uh, what happened to the character Ali Kandon on Battleground? Uh, what, what happened to the character? Yeah. I, uh, I think, he, are you asking like a story point of like where she goes from here? Yeah, what, like, what, what happened? I never saw him on the episode. Oh, oh Ali? Oh, oh, yeah. yeah. I auditioned for it. Oh, yeah. Well, that's interesting. All right. Uh, all right, now I got it. So we wrote this part, okay. and it was for a guy, All right. uh, and a guy came in who was terrible. <laughs> <laughs> and it was that guy! And no. then you were like, screw it, no, 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 true, no, true story. We, uh, we were auditioning people, uh, and uh, a girl came in to audition for a different part, and she was really good but wrong for the part. And I said, like, hey, what if it was a kind of a tech guy? And I said, what if we um, looked at girls for this part? Mm -hmm. uh, and this girl came back, and, and she she wasn't right for it. But we opened it up for a day to have somebody come in, and a girl named Allie came in and knocked it out of the park. Yeah. Um, and so when she tested for it, she went up against uh, two other guys, um, and uh, she beat them all. And so that's that's what happened. So with that Allie character. became Ollie. Yeah, exactly. I don't like changing my scripts at all, so <laughs> it's very difficult to find an Allie. But we, we did it. We did it. Um, that's about all the time we have for today. I, I want to ask one more question, yeah. um, just for people that are starting out in the industry. What are some of the traits that you think are most important if you're going to try to make it in this industry? Um, I guess this is cliche, but perseverance um, and just surrounding yourself with people who help you do what you want to do. Um, I would say faux confidence. <laughs> um, uh, I would say um, I, I'm amazed at, uh, uh, you know, what my wife would, used to watch America's Next Top Model and there would be, um, they would have a 20,000 people selected to go to the, um, uh, you know, uh, would try to audition for it. And then they'd select 200, and then there only 20 would be selected from there. This is like a couple weeks of episodes. And then 20, and then those 20 people would be like, congratulations, you got it. Show up tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. in the, you know, uh, in the lobby. You have to be there right at 8 a.m. And sure enough, the next morning, after all this process and the biggest mm -hmm. thing in their lives, there would be like five or six people, like 8.07, 8, 8.10, some people still sleeping, rolling in. Um, and, and my theory was that even if you, sh even if you said, hey, uh, if you don't show up at 8 o'clock, we're going to shoot you dead in your bed, <laughs> that there would still be some performers yeah. who would not show up on time. Yep. <laughs> and so it is a rare thing. If you just show up and get your work done, mm -hmm. you know, what I, and are pleasant, yeah. man, you'd be surprised how far that will get you. you, need, you you're also going to need some talent. Yeah. But man, <laughs> pleasantness and, and, and uh, relaxation Reliability, yeah. man, crucial. Helps. Yep. It helps. Well, thank you so much for joining us, JD and Elizabeth. Um, you can check out their show on Hulu for free. It's called Battleground, um, and the next series will be being filmed very soon, so be on the lookout for that as well. Thank you so much, guys.